I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Jonathan Tepper, the founder of Variant Perception, an economic research group that works with institutional managers, hedge funds, and allocators to provide objective and comprehensive data and actionable ideas from leading indicators and emerging trends. He's also the author of three books, the most recent of which, The Myth of Capitalism, Monopolies, and the Death of Competition, received widespread acclaim earlier this year. Our conversation covers Jonathan's unusual upbringing, learning about currencies from Big Macs, building economic and liquidity forecasting models, and catering variant perceptions research to investors. We then turn to the myth of capitalism, discussing the history, causes, and ramifications of the absence of competition in U.S. industries, natural and unnatural monopolies, examples in the tech giants, funeral home operators, airports, and hospitals, and what can be done to counter this negative trend. Today's show is sponsored by Northern Trust Front Office Solutions. When I talk to investment teams and CIOs, they often echo the same concern, that they spend too much time managing data and not enough time analyzing it. Two years ago, Northern Trust took a different approach to this problem and funded an internal startup called Northern Trust Front Office Solutions. They gathered together a former endowment chief operating officer, a front office technologist from a multi-billion dollar hedge fund, an award-winning design team, and a fintech company founded by a quant who coded for Harry Markowitz himself, working alongside dozens of clients to take on this shared mission. The result is a cloud-based, custody-agnostic platform that empowers asset owners with better operations and technology support to meet their middle and front office needs. Visit northerntrust.com slash solutions for more information. Please enjoy my conversation with Jonathan Tepper. Jonathan, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Well, why don't we start at the beginning? I know your upbringing has some fascinating aspects to it. Yes, I suspect that my upbringing is one of the first things people notice because it is pretty weird. And when you're growing up, often things seem normal until you encounter other people who don't share the same background. So I think it was really sort of only late in high school and in college that I started realizing just how odd my childhood was. But my parents, my mother and father were Presbyterian missionaries, and they moved to Spain in the 1980s. And they started working with heroin addicts because Spain had one of the highest rates of heroin use in Europe. I mean, it still has a pretty high rate. And by coincidence, they settled in San Blas, which was a neighborhood in Madrid that had about 10,000 gypsies living there and a huge drug problem. And then they just started helping the addicts on the street, realized that, you know, they were sending them off to drug centers, particularly in the north of Spain. And they thought that there was so much need in Madrid that they decided to start a drug center. And so they started with one addict in 1985. And then today, there's drug centers in about 25 countries with over 2,500 addicts. And it's all run by the addicts themselves. So the drug rehab basically operates a series of businesses, you know, like sort of charity stores, whether it's secondhand furniture, secondhand clothing. I used to work in the summertime, so I'd work with the painting teams. My brother Peter would work with the mechanics. And basically, almost all the revenue for the entire center is generated by the addicts themselves. So like the sort of donations parts, less than three or four percent of the entire budget. So my father studied economics at Cambridge and then got his MBA at Harvard. And as it turned out, a lot of what he had been reading and learning (laughs) ended up becoming useful. (laughs) What did they do before? My father and mother had been missionaries for about four years in Mexico, and they'd been like student chaplains. And so they thought they were going to go to Madrid and work with students. And that was their line of thinking. And then it was only by seeing the need in the neighborhood. And it really started almost by accident. There was a 
young Australian missionary, Lindsay McKinsey, who now lives in Australia. But one addict said that he needed to get clean before his court date. He was a, a thief. So he had to show up in court and he wanted to get clean. And so he asked if he could stay for two weeks. And then Lindsay invited him to live in his apartment. Then he brought eight of his friends in. All the neighbors started complaining that there were all these addicts living in the building. So my father and Lindsay went and found a farm. And then they had 30 men living on the farm. And it just sort of growing exponentially like that because the need was so great. People just wanted to get off drugs. And almost all of the early addicts stayed and were helping others. And then they ended up going off and starting the center in other cities. So you mentioned that that experience was a little bit different from other people you were around. How do you think it impacted you? One, I saw my parents were real entrepreneurs, even though they were, they were missionaries, they were starting businesses all over Spain, run by the addicts. They trusted them. I also learned a lot of leadership lessons from my parents. There's a very good book called Mastery by Robert Greene, and the, the two simple rules he has is, one, find a great mentor, and two, get rid of them. And I think that what often happens in organizations is that the person running the show doesn't really want the mentee or the person under them to develop a lot. And I think that my parents did that very well, which is when people did very well, they got responsibility and were given their own sort of new center or new city to start. And I think you see that with some very good companies where, you know, people are sort of promoted and given more responsibility. And because of that, people stay for a long time because they can grow rather than feel that they're sort of stifled, you know, within, let's say, staying in the same city, in the same role, under the same person. And so I really learned quite a lot from them in terms of that aspect of management. And how did that take you through your education and into your career? It was very strange because my parents were missionaries in the 1980s, and the way that it worked, a lot of your American churches would send money, and I became acutely aware at the age of 10 that foreign exchange was a big issue because my grandparents would send me checks, and so I would get something like $20 you know, for my birthday. And I would take my brothers to McDonald's, you know, which is like a treat in the 1980s and in Madrid. And so I realized I was buying half as many <laughs> Big Macs for my brothers as I used to by coincidence at the same time as The Economist came out with the Big Mac Index. And my father started explaining to me foreign exchange and economics. And I just thought it was so fascinating that I then became slightly obsessed by economics and finance because my parents also weren't <laughs> getting their salary cut in half. It wasn't just my Big Macs. They didn't really have very much money. And so my mother taught us at home for two years. And one of my favorite pictures is of my mother teaching us at home, so homeschooling. And I hated it at the time because I thought it was very embarrassing to not to be able to go to school with my friends. But it was extraordinarily liberating because I realized that as long as I had the books and the desire, I could learn anything I wanted and I could go at whatever pace I wanted. And after that, when you know, I did go back to school with my brothers and then my older brother went off to college, I got him to send me all his freshman textbooks. And so I then was able to take 10 advanced placement tests and got credit for about two years of college. So I could have gone through college in two years, but ended up doing four just because I thought I can only go through college once. Might as well take advantage of this time and be working the rest of my life. Did you start studying economics in college? My brother sent me his college economics textbooks. So I had already done like the first year micro, macro and international trade by the time I enrolled as a freshman. And so then it gave me time to do more advanced topics and then do my honors thesis, which was on optimal currency area theory. So that was sort of pre-euro. That was 97, 98. And I thought the euro was an incredibly stupid idea because, you know, I was looking at the correlation of employment shocks with Netherlands and Germany and Spain and Germany and the sort of core periphery issues quite were already evident then. And it was clear that there were different business cycles. And so setting one interest rate or one monetary policy wasn't going to work. As you developed your knowledge of macroeconomics, currency, how did you come to form views that led into what you've done with Varian Perception? So Varian Perception is the economic research company that I started about 10 years ago with a couple colleagues. And that really almost grew up by accident before that. So I started out as an equity analyst at SAC Capital, but I, I still had that sort of economics bug in my brain. And a friend was running the prop desk at Bank of America in London. So I went over to work with him. And it was at the time that I just started consuming loads of economic research and realized that a lot of it was, I didn't think, very suited to our purposes. So trying to figure out when the next recession was going to happen in 05, 07. And I started doing loads and loads of research. And I thought, surely some economists have already solved this one. And I realized that nine out of 10 economists had missed the last four recessions where we had the blue chip consensus estimates. And so I thought all the bond traders that were sitting next to us on the prop desk were trading non-farm payrolls. And I realized all this data gets heavily revised. So it's pretty useless anyway. And I thought we only make money by what's going to happen, not by what has happened. And then more importantly, it doesn't matter whether the economy is good or bad. What matters is the change in the direction. So markets are all about surprise. So I thought if I can figure out where things are going and have a better sense of where assets 
assets are priced relative to what one would expect, I think that's where you get very interesting trading ideas. So variant, what we do is build leading economic and leading liquidity indicators. And to the extent that our tools diverge from what we're seeing in prices, that's where you end up with surprise. And that's where you end up with trading opportunities. And the other thing I saw was that a lot of the research I was consuming was by people I respected and liked, but ultimately it was a guru. And I think that macro in particular has a focus and an emphasis on gurus. And the problem there is that it's a crystal ball in a way, and it's like a black box. These guys supposedly can read the future, and you don't really know how they do it, right? They have some sort of inspiration. And I thought, surely this could be done in a way that's robust, uh, repeatable, and scalable. You know, So if you develop certain insights about how business cycles work, you should be able to apply this across multiple economies, and then you should be able to apply this across time. I'm starting with this skeptical premise. And anytime you think about forecasting, there's always been so much noise around any signal. With that sort of healthy degree of skepticism, why don't you walk through how you sort of took apart what these indicators are? Certainly. So on the the leading economic side, there are certain things that tell you where the economy is going to be in three, six, nine, or 12 months. And it's generally difficult to look out past that, particularly on the growth side. On the inflation side, because inflation is so lagging, so if you think of supermarkets don't immediately start raising prices until they're sure the demand is there, they don't start cutting prices until they're sure that it's dropping off, and then wage cycles are yearly, so you wait to ask for your raise, and then it takes time to feed through. So inflation lags considerably, but generally when you're looking at the economic cycle, there are certain things that intuitively make sense and have a clear cause and effect. So For example, the building cycle, whether it's housing, particularly residential, when you get a building permit, you know that you've got this sort of long pathway of visibility where you're going to have to go break ground, hire workers, and when the house is done, people are going to go out and buy white goods and carpets. And so it gives you a long lead intuitively in the way that some other indicators don't. The yield curve, there's an extensive amount of academic research and research that we've done that shows that it's very useful. People tend to ignore it at most points in time. I mean, lately, people are getting obsessed with it, which is quite rare. Normally, people ignore it. But even there, for example, it makes complete sense, right? Banks are in the business of essentially borrowing short and lending long. And so to the extent that the yield curve flattens significantly, it compresses net interest margins and therefore has an impact on lending and liquidity in markets. So we try to find things like that that make complete sense when you explain it to someone. There's no sort of real magic in what we do. It's identifying sensibly what things are useful and then aggregating them and turning them into an index where you can take multiple components together and then see what the overall picture is. So what's different in the indicators that you use from, you know, I'm thinking of the broad level leading indicators? So the work on leading economic indicators goes back many decades, and we certainly are not the ones to invent them. You can go back to Victor Zarnowitz, Jeffrey Moore, and others, and then you have the OECD and so the conference board with their leading indicators. And then if you look at like the big banks, only Goldman has a few leading indicators. Most economists, like the Fed, ignores them. The Wall Street banks ignore them. There is a very good research company called ECRI that does some leading indicators. But what we try to do, and the only reason and we care about them is because actually we want to try to help clients make money. So if a sector or an economy at large is turning down, according to our tools, and the markets are not pricing that in, then you get a very asymmetric sort of risk reward in terms of, you know, like for example, before recessions or growth downturns. Likewise, when everyone's extremely negative and valuations are quite low and our tools are turning up, then that's very helpful. But in terms of sort of how ours are different, we focus very heavily on liquidity. So for example, If the auto leading indicators are turning down, that's interesting, but no one directly trades car sales in the US, right? It's just not tradable. What you trade is GM and Ford stocks. And stocks themselves are leading indicators because they're essentially forward looking and investors talk to management, they go to showrooms, they're gathering a lot of data points. And so what you really want to do is get a lead on stock prices themselves. And so we've done an enormous amount of work on global financial conditions, liquidity conditions on a country specific basis, and then on an aggregate consolidated basis. And those are very, very useful because they tend to lead the economic leading indicators themselves by about six months, and they tend to lead asset prices too. So we have uh, a lot of our liquidity indicators will lead commodity prices. Um, they'll lead even stock prices by a good six, nine, 12 months. And are those market level liquidity indicators or do they also drill down into different sectors? 
some sectors are much more cyclical, others less so. And it's not to say that, for example, healthcare telecoms are unaffected by global liquidity changes. They certainly are. But the biggest beta to our indicators tends to come from the highly cyclical sectors. So if some of our liquidity indicators, for example, are contracting, then iron ore and copper or Baltic dry, things that are very cyclically sensitive, uh, will tend to have a much bigger move. You've also talked in a lot of your research about catching inflection points and particularly to the downside and protecting the downside. Obviously an important thing to be able to do, notoriously difficult. How do you go about trying to catch that inflection? So the main moves that we've seen in markets with our leading indicators are when you go from positive to negative in the indicators, you essentially have a first derivative change. And then when you're going from the second derivative, essentially it's negative, but less negative. And that's where you get the biggest moves in asset prices. So for example, our China leading indicator does a phenomenal job of leading Chinese growth. And there, when it starts turning down and you see, let's say, the China-related plays, whether it's the Aussie dollar or copper or other things still levitating, that's a great risk-reward trade where we know that the indicators are telling us that that's going to turn down. So, for example, our China index leads semiconductor sales. And so where there's a big discrepancy between the tools, first derivative, i.e. positive to negative, that's a fantastic tell. And then on the upside, when we're looking at the upturn in our indicators, for example, the classic is where you can combine fundamentals with technicals and valuation. And they're Brazil, for example, in late 2015, early 2016, our leading indicators for Brazil were surging and turning up pretty strongly. And same was true for China. And everyone was very negative on Brazil. And if you remember, there was the front cover of The Economist with Dilma Rousseff on it. I went around to see clients in the US. I did about 20 meetings in a week and a half. Not a single client besides one endowment liked Brazil. And it told me that you didn't need very much for it to get marginally less worse for Brazilian stocks to do well. And that was the bottom in the equity markets and our leading indicators were flagging that. So like those are specific cases where they can help you make quite a lot of money in terms of allocating to these trades. So you have a range of clients, There's a fair number of hedge fund managers, you mentioned endowments. How do they use your research? I would say that everyone uses it slightly differently in terms of different funds have their own internal processes, and then some of them have different mandates. But there's a couple use cases. So for example, a lot of our clients are equity long short funds, and their real fear is essentially being blown up and caught off guard like in 2008, where they had massive drawdowns, and they were often exposed to cyclical sectors or banks. And so what they really want to use us is as an insurance policy of sorts, where they want to know that things are turning down. So they use us for that purpose. And we also have, by the way, like a lot of market health indicators and buy and sell signals that we've generated to try to capture these divergences in terms of sentiment positioning and so on. I think for some of the allocators who might have a longer time frame, they're not so worried about what's happening month to month, but they would like some slightly longer term themes in terms of what should they be avoiding, what should they be allocating to. So when we started out, the first big report that we wrote, I wrote that one and it was called Spain, a hole in Europe's balance sheet. And it was essentially laying out the path ahead for Spain and part of the periphery. And so being able to avoid that at the time was very, very useful. Likewise, the Brazil long or other positive, we've recently put out a piece early this year on Argentina. These are things where you might decide that you want to make a longer term allocation for because you're catching it at a pretty low point and an inflection. So that's how the longer term investors tend to use what we do. When you look at other forecasters, you said you're trying to make this robust and scalable and repeatable and other people are gurus. It's not to say that we're the only people who've uncovered some of these ideas or relationships, and certainly there's quite a lot of other research out there, and I don't want to denigrate some of the gurus who I still admire, but I thought that that's not repeatable. They might be able to hire someone and train them and teach them, but it's probably like a one-off. And I thought, surely the best thing to do is to create a system that not could be run by an idiot, but could be run by someone perhaps who doesn't have that touch of genius or whatever it might be. If you're looking at people I, I really like and admire, whether it's David Rosenberg or others, he's great, but I don't know what the transmission is to someone else and so on. I wanted to create a system where if I left, the machine would keep plugging along. And a lot of what I see is whatever chart is popular or whatever the latest data release is, people get fixated on that in general. And so you suffer from recency bias, essentially, where you're chasing the headlines and it's all trailing, right? And so what I wanted to do is to construct a system that was fairly coherent and allowed for a systematic approach. And that's really what we've tried to do, which is to assemble good ingredients and then be able to approach it systematically. So how do you go from spending your days creating models of liquidity indicators and leading indicators on the economy 
to writing a book about monopolies? So the answer to that is that one of the charts that really bugged me was we have a leading indicator for U.S. wages. And the indicator itself, when you invert it or you turn it upside down, leads corporate profits very well. And so, you know, wages are one of the biggest parts of the corporate spending and employees are a huge part. So if employees are not getting most of the economic pie, then corporations are and therefore corporate profits are going to be very high. And that's exactly what we've seen over the last couple of years. Our indicator was telling us that wages should be going up. And so I was going to visit clients, many here in Midtown. And I remember like one meeting specifically where I was looking at it at Central Park and the hedge fund manager was telling me, he's like, well, your indicator's broken. It's just not working. And I said, well, no, no, our indicators work very well. They do. I said, just give it time. And of course, went back to his office again a year later. And he's like, your indicator still doesn't work. And I thought, oh dear, this is pretty bad. I need to go look into this one. And so I started looking into why is it that wages just really weren't going up very much and why our indicator might be broken. And sometimes the world does change. So some of our fixed income models after QE really stopped working. If you knew what growth rate was and what inflation was, that wouldn't have told you anything about where the 10-year yield should be. So I wanted to find out, one, are these indicators broken or is there something I'm missing? And so looking into the question of why corporate profit margins were so high, that was the first thing that led me down that path. But then secondly, I was going to the pub in, in London with some friends of mine, and they're non-economists, but they were telling me, oh, we just read this amazing book by Thomas Piketty. He's saying there's a fatal flaw in capitalism and returns to capital you know, are going to get bigger and bigger, and eventually it'll end capitalism. And I just thought this doesn't make any sense at all. Like if returns on capital get higher, you know, let's say you have a great business, then I'm going to want to compete with your business. And that'll drive down the returns on capital. Capital. And so it's a naturally self-correcting mechanism. And then I thought, well, maybe these two questions are related because if the competition can't come in and compete, if you can't drive down the returns on capital, then yes, you would end up with a persistence of very high corporate profit margins, low wage capture, low increase in wages. And maybe that's what's going on. So I didn't have a predetermined thesis before I started writing the book. What I really wanted to do is to figure out why this was happening. And I started doing a lot of research on competition. And the key paper that I read that I highly recommend, and I think there's a, I'm pretty sure there's a link to it on the website site, mythofcapitalism.com. It's by Gustavo Grullón, who's a professor at Rice. And he wrote that with two colleagues. And it's called, Our Industry is Becoming More Concentrated. And the issue was, he was trying to look at, for the median industry, are there fewer competitors? Is there less competition at the national level today versus 10, 20 years ago? And the answer is, for about two-thirds of industries, the answer is, is there's a lot less competition. So that paper itself started uh, tied the high profit margins to competition and pointed out that it's not because these firms are just that much better and more efficient, they're getting a higher return on assets and it comes from scale. Rather, they end up with pricing power, which of course is what Buffett talks about. So you end up with power over the consumer and then also you end up with power over the worker. You don't have to pay your workers as much because there's not much competition. All right. So the book's called The Myth of Capitalism. And how would you describe if somebody said, okay, what is the myth of capitalism? So the myth of capitalism was one that I picked because I thought everyone's critiquing capitalism, saying it has these horrible flaws and it's terrible. And I think that what we're seeing right now is not true capitalism in the sense that capitalism involves one, private property, but two, also involves competition, meaning that supply and demand can set prices. And ultimately, when you look at supply, it's sort of constricted. You're not really dealing with a multitude of players. You're dealing with very few. And they often use government to keep competitors out. So these aren't just sort of natural monopolies that might emerge due to industry structure, whether that's network effects, you know, for example, like Visa, it makes sense to have one payment system or a huge scale where you end up with for very large planes like Boeing or Airbus. But there are just many industries where there's absolutely no reason why they should be a duopoly or an oligopoly. And a lot of this comes down to regulation. And so the myth of capitalism, in my mind, is that we're not really looking at a true capitalist system because there isn't competition. So how come this is a problem? So if you wanted to talk about it at a broad theoretical level, clearly there are some economic arguments that you could offer, and then you can drill down to why the average person might care. On the economic angle, 
while there are efficiencies to scale in some industries, beyond a certain point, those go down to zero. And if not, then become diseconomies of scale. So you end up with problems of productivity, problems, harms to innovation. You find that primarily, I would argue, on the digital side, but it certainly happens in other industries. You end up with fewer jobs and less economic vitality. Churning and creation of new companies and competition is an important part. Even if you think about the traditional disruptor literature, you don't know which startups are going to be the good ones or succeed and a lot will fail, but you have to have that going on. So you end up with more anemic economic growth, but you also end up with a lot more inequality. So if companies are able to extract economic rents and they're able to squeeze workers, then what's going to happen is that in many industries across the U.S., these companies work as very efficient means of transferring money from the middle and lower class to people who own shares. The average person doesn't really own shares in any meaningful way. And therefore, what Piketty talked about certainly does happen, which is that you end up with an increase in inequality. And and it doesn't come because there's a fatal flaw in capitalism. It comes because essentially there's not enough competition. I capitalism itself is not functioning properly. It's not true capitalism. All right. So as you laid it out in the book, we could start with the obvious one, which is the tech giants. So everyone thinks about – so you, know, you wrote something about that. What's your take on that The perspective of where monopolies are a problem or become a problem with the tech giants? What's interesting is almost any interview that I do about the book always starts with the tech giants is the first question. So it's a great thing, meaning that people might not be talking about monopolies right now if the tech giants hadn't raised this issue. And there's certainly a lot of other hidden monopolies. So to the extent that monopoly is now becoming a, a common word in our vocabulary again, I think it's a wonderful thing. So Google and Facebook essentially are an ad duopoly in terms of the ad market. Google is a monopoly when it comes to search with roughly about 90% market share globally. Facebook on the social side is a little over 80%. On the social side, you obviously have Twitter, Snapchat, and so on. But basically, they have monopolies in their respective fields, and then they have a duopoly when it comes to online ads. And the big problem here essentially is that while there are very strong feedback loops, Google is essentially like a two-sided market between searchers and advertisers. And then Facebook essentially has very strong network effects. You want to be on the social network where all your friends are. One of the big problems here is that they're able to use their platform to their own benefit. So Google is not just serving you every single search result according to their page rank. They actually can favor Google-related businesses. They're able to make sure that Google reviews and other Google services pop up before competitor services. And so you can tilt the playing field to your advantage. Facebook effectively killed off Vine by preventing that from being shared, which was Twitter's video platform. Facebook wanted to own video. So you can use the platform essentially from a competitive standpoint. It's a problem. And then the regulators have essentially... I would say been asleep at the wheel, but that's too benign. Macon Delrahim, for example, is the attorney general for antitrust in the U.S. He was Google's lobbyist for the DoubleClick acquisition. The recent settlement that was reached between Facebook and the FTC, Facebook's lead lawyer essentially worked for the head of the FTC, and this agreement has now immunized them from all private claims. There's no even revolving door that implies some separation. You basically have people going working for industry back in government, then negotiating with their former partners. And so there's no real effort to, one, prevent mergers. So Google was able to basically buy DoubleClick. Facebook was able to buy Instagram. And so the laws as written and intended are not enforced. And then you end up obviously with even more of a winner-take-all dynamic when it comes to these tech companies. But at least it's shined a spotlight into the problem of concentration. In addition to the tech giants, I'm just going to ramble off a laundry list of some of the sectors that you discuss in the book, and maybe we can pick one or two and talk about them. So this isn't just tech giants. It's insurance, paper, agriculture, hospitals, cable, airlines, beer, milk, funerals, payments, dialysis, glasses, tax preparation, credit bureaus, banks, meat and poultry, PBMs, medical care, and title insurance as a subset. So is there a commonality in those sectors and subsectors? Yes. You could broadly put those different industries into two separate categories. One would be what you could call natural monopolies. Economists tend to refer to natural monopolies as industries like electrical utilities. It doesn't make sense to lay down copper wires to every home in Manhattan. You get one and then you just regulate it to make sure that they're not gouging people and they get a return on assets and so on. But I use the term a little more broadly where you know the delivery of the product dictates there not be many, many players. And earlier I referenced network effects and things like that. You then have another broad 
set of companies that what I call unnatural monopolies. Absent regulation or legislation, there would be multiple competitors and you would not have two companies dominating the U.S. beer industry. For example, the idea that Burger King or McDonald's might achieve a duopoly in the restaurant industry is insane. Basically, you and I could go get a kitchen and a cook and start competing. The question why this doesn't happen when it comes to alcohol is because even though there has been an explosion of craft breweries, most craft breweries don't really ship their beer beyond county lines. This is essentially a a legislative and regulatory problem where going back to the ending of prohibition, what happened was it was all devolved down to the states and to the counties. It's very difficult for companies to get national distribution. So that those who do have it have a pretty big advantage. And then through a series of mergers, because the regulators don't honestly care, you've ended up with two companies having over 75% market share, but effectively controlling around 90% market share. So you have a duopoly in terms of production and volume and sales, and then you have an oligopoly in terms of distribution. And all of this is really legislative. I mean, American beer in general is just pretty terrible for the big brands, and they'd probably be losing even more market share if a lot of the craft brewers could actually get more trade beyond the counties. Are there other notable examples where regulation created an unnatural monopoly? In Alabama, there were some monks who thought that to help the monastery, they might sell coffins made of wood, and these were like beautiful coffins. And of course, the local funeral homes went after them and sued them, and then the state of Alabama went after them for providing wooden coffins. For centuries, we've all managed to die and decompose without a problem in wooden coffins. But what's ended up happening in many states is that you have local monopolies where mergers are allowed, and so service corporation is the biggest. They've ended up with like a monopoly in a town, in a given radius. But to help maintain this, often there are restrictions in terms of who can sell caskets and in terms of where can these funeral homes be provided and what kind of criteria they have to meet. And it's only done essentially to prevent competition and to exclude others. The insurance industry is one that basically should be a lot more competitive and you should essentially have competition across state lines, but you don't. The McCarran-Ferguson Act essentially devolved regulation down to the state level, which meant that the state insurance commissioners are the ones who decide things. So you essentially have a duopoly or three players in almost all states when it comes to health insurance. And then states mandate that you buy title insurance on your house, even though the General Accounting Office and the New York Times have called it a scam. You know, in the 21st century where records are almost all digital, why should you have to be forced to buy insurance for your title? So there's all all sorts of industries that essentially exist purely due to legislation and, and regulation. You then have some other ones that are much less obvious, which are, for example, local airports, right? Cities generally, besides New York or London, don't really have room for two or three airports. There's just not enough traffic. And so if you have the airport concession, you have a captive audience every day that's growing a little faster than GDP spending money while they wait for their flight. And so that's like a small local monopoly. And those are just like two examples. But there are loads of hidden niches that people don't really look at and realize that generate significantly higher returns than the average stock. And some of these are well-behaved, meaning they provide a great service to the user. They don't gouge the user. My problem with monopolies is generally where they behave anti-competitively and gouge users. A classic one that hedge funds love and that I think is horrific is Transdime. Basically, there's not competition because to get an FAA part approved takes a very long time. And so you and I can go and provide seatbelts cheaper than Transdime. And anytime they buy a company, they're basically a roll up. They hike prices by five, six hundred, seven hundred percent. And they're being looked into by the Department of Defense because the Department of Defense is being gouged, right? And is society better off because all these small cost panels or seat belts are are much higher? No, it just basically enriches the CEO and a few shareholders. I mean, you've compared that to sort of the Valiant story. The concept of Transdime was always that these are very low priced parts compared to a plane or something like that. So how do you think about that price dynamic where how much does a seatbelt cost? Oh, yeah, you could raise the price of a seatbelt. That's an, an argument that some smart hedge fund investors have, and they and there's like a class of companies that are low price in terms of the relation to the whole, and therefore it gives you some pricing power. And this you often find this with drugs, where the pharma industry says, well, drugs are only about 10% of U.S. spending. They're the largest part of the spending that employers pay and the consumers pay out of pocket. And if you look at some of these drugs, while it might be a total part of the whole, gouging a customer and getting, there was Wilson's disease was the classic with Valiant, where 
where absent regulation, they would not be able to charge 300 grand a year for a life-threatening drug that really should cost pennies, right? And so to me, that's just price gouging with no aggregate benefit. Like there's no benefit that you're deriving or that society is deriving from these companies providing it. There's basically just a lack of competition from legal and regulatory reasons. And then people are gouged. It's that simple. Uh, One of my favorites was always the eyeglasses industry. And it was stunning to learn that it's really one company or two. Yes. So the Luxotica is a Italian company. They've recently merged with Essilor, which is a French company. So they've vertically integrated it. So Luxotica basically does the frames. Essilor does the lenses. And they argue that they're not that high when it comes to glasses for the entire world. They have close to a monopoly when it comes to the branded glasses. And then they've also been buying up where people think that there's a choice, you know, between like lens crafters and others, or you go to these chains. These are all actually owned by Luxotica. And so you can just go through the dozens of brands that they actually own under different labels. So you think you're shopping around and doing price comparison. In fact, you're all buying from the same company. And in industry after industry, what's happened is that the DOJ and the FTC over the years, the level at which they will scrutinize mergers has sort of gone up and up. And then effectively, they've blocked almost no mergers and scrutinized almost no mergers. Why is it that the regulators haven't scrutinized some of these mergers if it's creating this absence of competition? So one is ideological. I think many of them actually do think that monopolies are better. So the history of the U.S. monopoly movement in a few sentences basically is you had a huge move to regulate the trust, the monopolies in the 1880s, wasn't very well enforced. You ended up with the Clayton Act in 1914. That was after Standard Oil was broken up. And antitrust wasn't really enforced until the 1930s under FDR. So you had like a merger wave in the 1920s. And then after FDR, basically, there was quite a lot of antitrust enforcement, and then it became the consensus. And so Republicans and Democrats blocked mergers. Eisenhower talked about it in his State of the Union, and this was widely accepted. And it it became so ingrained that it was very difficult for almost any competitors to merge. And so there was a famous case, some grocery stores in Los Angeles that were going to merge and achieve 7% market share, and that was blocked. And so some of the economists thought, you know what, we've gone too far. And they were probably right in the 1960s. Back then, you had the conglomerate wave. And part of that was if you couldn't buy your competitor, you'd buy some random company. So you ended up with, you know, like a Hollywood studio owned by an oil company, which also owned a ball bearing company and a cigar factory. And those all got broken up, but you just couldn't buy your competitors. And so these economists, particularly from the University of Chicago, you had Milton Friedman, George Stigler, and then you had Robert Bork on the legal side who wrote the antitrust paradox, but basically argued that mergers were good. They would create efficiencies. Those would get passed on to consumers. And price was the only thing that mattered. And if you ignored price, then basically it was just demagoguery. And so even though none of these ideas are present in the Sherman Antitrust Act or in the Clayton Act, this basically was the thinking and the ideology that they had. And when Reagan came to power, he appointed Baxter to the Justice Department, and then they changed the merger guidelines in 1982. And so ever since, what we've had is a merger wave after merger wave. And at first, it didn't make that much of a big deal. But I mean, you can remember like the movie Wall Street, it was about mergers and tips. And you had the book Den of Thieves by James Stewart. And that was a big thing. And now we've gotten so used to it that, you know, no one bats an eye when they're mergers. But when you have four decades of mergers one after the other, you basically are in a situation like the World Cup or the Sweet 16, where you start with 16 teams and you go down to eight and then to four. And so the damage is not done in a single year, but over a 40-year period, many industries have gone from being highly competitive to now essentially being in the hands of two or three players. So you mentioned the notion of price, which is, I know when I was studying about antitrust, it was... Are the consumers hurt because prices are artificially high? What are the alternatives to that metric as a means of trying to determine whether a merger should or shouldn't be able to go through? Firstly, like if they did focus on price, I would be thrilled. I think the problem is that they say that they care about price, but then they allow tons of mergers to go through where prices actually go up. So I would say it's just a complete absence of enforcement of their own standard. It reminds me of what Gandhi said. They once asked Gandhi what he thought of Western civilization. He said he thought it would be a good idea. The sort of consumer welfare standard about price, I think, would be a good idea if it was actually practiced. There's extensive evidence that mergers, particularly under six players, lead to higher prices. But even moving beyond on price. So in the case of the digital giants, Facebook's free, Google's free. So like, who's complaining? There's no harm. The arguments there are, one, the anti-competitive effects, which is i.e. that they are discriminating against other people. And 
And there are cases in the 19th century, for example, where railroads had the only bridge going across the Mississippi. And if you have the only bridge, the law stated that you had to provide sort of open and non-discriminatory access to your competitors, right? You can't just because you have it doesn't mean that you can't allow your competitors to use it. And I would argue that if these businesses are in the business of providing search results, then they shouldn't be favoring their own. Or if Amazon's in the business of providing sort of a third-party delivery of goods, they can't ultimately be favoring their own goods, uh, screwing their suppliers, essentially using advertising as a tax for the competitors to show up in the search results. But then you also have harms to innovation, meaning that if these platforms don't want competitors and have access to whether it's APIs and they can shut them out, you end up with what you could call edge innovation, right? Where you have harms to innovation that happen. And all of these, I think, do make sense and are beyond price. But ultimately, the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act were much more political than purely economic, meaning that there was a decision that we don't want to live in a society where one or two people control entire industries. And so I think that to focus exclusively on price without actually realizing the reasoning behind why we have these laws you know, is missing the forest for the trees. Somewhere behind the, the curtain in D.C., there are people who are the ones who are deciding whether or not a merger goes through or what the impact of that is. And as you said earlier, there is this revolving door in D.C. where someone who's a lobbyist works in the government and then they make more money in the private sector. What's the alternative to get good people in government who can't then go into private industry? So right now, a lot of the people who work in antitrust and the DOJ and FTC, many of them are fine people, but they do tend to come from the K Street law firms or from the two consulting groups that do almost all the research arguing that mergers are wonderful and that there's not a problem, which is Compass Lexicon and Charles Rivers Associates. And so I think that if you're dealing with a broad field such as it is, you can clearly cast a wider net when you're looking at people who should be serving in the DOJ and the FTC and not necessarily going and hiring people who would have to recuse themselves when the cases come up or who certainly don't want to see any impediments to future mergers that might harm them when they're on the way out. I wrote a piece for the American Conservative about this. I think that they titled it Why Regulators Went Soft on Monopolies. And I went through a dozen revolvers, and some of them have been doing it now for 40 years. So the idea that they're representing you or me or the consumer makes no sense. What they're ultimately doing is it's what Nassim Taleb called the retrospective bribe, where it's not like someone's giving them a suitcase of cash, but rather they're very aware and conscious that if they're going to go back to their law firm, they want to make sure that they've made the right choices. And so the evidence is overwhelming on a case-by-case basis when you go through and look at their careers that the regulators essentially are fully captured. When you read through the book... You get this sense that it's very much a haves and have nots. And if you're part of one of these companies, you're probably in a, particularly if you're an owner, in a pretty good spot. So if you're on this mission through the book of trying to figure out, like, we have a problem, we've identified a problem, we need to foster better competition, as an individual, what do you do about it? So I started out just to, at first it was a little disorganized. I had like a, just one tab in a spreadsheet and I just kept on dropping notes in. And then I started organizing it more and then I organized it more and more. And then eventually ended up with this extraordinarily organized, highly detailed map of the U.S. And then I thought, okay, well, if I've got it for the U.S., I should do this abroad. And I started doing it for abroad. So basically I have a extremely detailed industry map of highly concentrated industries with all the companies and players laid out. And then I've classified them by whether they're natural or unnatural and sort of the source of the monopoly or oligopoly. And what's quite clear is as I started doing that, I was finding Buffett behind loads of them, right? And in the first chapter of the book talks about Buffett and Teal. And I think they're both slightly different. So Buffett tends to like what I call the unnatural monopolies, right? So he's an owner of Moody's. That only exists because there's an act of Congress which created the NRSRO designation, and it's easier to raise an armed militia in the U.S. than it is to start a rating agency. Teal praised monopolies, but interestingly, if you read his book, the only examples he gives of monopolies are essentially ones that have very strong network effects you know, in feedback loops where you do end up with a winner-take-all dynamic. Um, he never talks about the drugstore duopoly with CVS and Walgreens. That's purely down to regulation, essentially. So Teal praises monopoly, but ultimately is really looking at the natural monopolies. So when I was building this database, I realized like this essentially is like a roadmap for Buffett. So... Obviously, it's quite useful on the investing side. And I think that 
Buffett himself, he is a progressive, he's a Democrat. Ultimately, he's not doing very much to change the status quo, and he's certainly not encouraging any reform of Moody's. He loves his checks. I would love one day to be an enlightened Robert Barron and give the money to good causes and to end monopolies. So like, I probably will be doing something ultimately with this database. So the, <laughs> if you can't beat them, join them, I guess. Yeah, I think you have to be a Robin Hood of sorts. You've identified that this is a problem. What would you suggest the country, if it's the appropriate entity, do about the problem? So the last chapter of the book, or I can't even remember if it's an epilogue or a chapter, but it has a series of proposals because I, I realized that if this book did catch on at all, it would end up getting read by regulators and legislators. And I've given up hope on the regulators. I don't actually think that any of them, one, agree or two, care. But the legislators, I think many of them do. And they have been getting in touch with me. So I have been speaking to senators and congressmen and even the staff of presidential candidates. And they do care deeply about this issue. And I think that the solutions and reform is going to come from the legislative side. So I thought I needed to have a blueprint essentially for reform. And you could broadly lay out a couple simple proposals. One, you have to undo past mergers that are harmful. In the past, whether Standard Oil got broken up, AT&T got broken up, the world didn't end. It actually got much better. And I think that there are many mergers that should clearly be broken up and things would improve. But the main point going forward is that the merger guidelines every few years go higher and higher where they had to reach such a level of concentration that before getting blocked, one, you can dramatically reduce that and say that the what they call the HHI index for concentration should be much lower to begin any scrutiny. And they should, I think, have a bright lines. So for example, if an industry has six players or fewer, a merger shouldn't be allowed. We just know that prices go up when that happens. You end up with less competition. So mergers to duopoly should never be allowed. Mergers even down to four players in general, I don't think should be allowed. And that's one of the main things. I think ending the revolving door is a key thing. So you want to make sure that when people are working at the DOJ, FTC, they can immediately go back to the private sector to then represent clients who want to get their mergers through. And then there are all sorts of other more particular things, industry by industry. Earlier, I talked about the insurance industry, right? Believe it or not, the insurance industry is exempt from antitrust supervision under McCarran-Ferguson, right? Like this is truly insane. I would get rid of the entire act, but at a minimum, I would not make them exempt from uh, antitrust supervision. So those are just some of the simple reform proposals. Sounds simple in concept. You're now, from time to time, having conversations with the people who are empowered to do something like that. What do you see about the practicality of some of these? So I think change takes time. And while I am hopeful that there is the beginning of change, I'm not overly optimistic about how quickly it will happen. But I think that people are becoming more aware of the need. And it's not just on the left. So the idea is that somehow there are these sort of crazy progressives out there who want to attack big companies. I think the conservatives are starting to realize that you could actually have much lower healthcare costs if you got rid of excessive regulation that prevents competition. You could end up with lower insurance and medical costs if we allowed, for example, insurance to be sold across state lines, or you allowed the importation of generic drugs from a similarly regulated country. Why shouldn't we be able to import generic drugs from Canada or from the EU or from Japan? So there are all sorts of things that could be done, and employers who are paying would like to have lower drug costs, would like to have have lower insurance costs. And so left and right are recognizing that the current situation only benefits those who are capturing the economic rents. All right, let's turn to some closing questions. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? It's probably changed over time. I think it was art and photography, but lately it's been writing. And I think I write to clarify my own thoughts, to answer questions, and I've written a couple books. I blog occasionally, and then now I'm, I'm writing a memoir about growing up in San Blas called Shooting Up, and I'll probably have that done later this year. And it, it's a complete radical change in style. You know, writing nonfiction is one thing. Writing, even though a memoir is real, it's written in a fictional way in the sense that the voice is different, the way that you write is different. So th- that's been fun. When do you do your writing? I write in spurts. When I do write, whether it's the books like Myth or others, I tend to like lock myself away for a week and work eight to 10 hours a day and then take a week or two off and then go back to it. So I work in intense spurts, but I don't understand that people can do like three hours consistently every day, but everyone has their own (laughs) writing style. What's your biggest pet peeve? On a human level, probably loss of temper, saying nasty things. I've seen that. And I think it happens a lot in the trading floors and other places. And in my entire life, I've never seen my parents raise their voice to anyone. And I think if you can't control yourself, it's going to be unlikely that you're going to control a business or even relations with other people well. And how about your biggest investment pet peeve? 
probably gold bugs investing in bad industries. I mean, they're totally one irrational. There are some nice gold bugs. But in general, I find that this investment thesis is not amenable to logical discussion. And then even when I show them the historically poor returns from gold mines over time, it still doesn't dissuade them. And so it's really a, a religion. So does that flow through the pro arguments for Bitcoin? Bitcoin is another long topic, which I think fails on almost every front. If currency is a means of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value, it fails on all three fronts. And so uh, gold essentially could be a useful investment, given that it's the inverse of the real rate. So to the extent that real rates are negative, it might be a good investment. But gold mines themselves are terrible. And gold has a limited function in terms of a bet on negative real rates. That's it. And Bitcoin? Bitcoin, I think, is a pretty bad investment. All the smart people I know in Silicon Valley who made loads and loads of money bought early and sold early. And, you know, it was all the sort of dumb retail people who piled in late. What have you learned recently that's most struck you? So I thought of writing a book on the history of financial markets, and I may do that at one stage. And the thing that really struck me doing all this research was that we think that we live in new and interesting times. A lot of these problems have been looked at over time, and whether it's Romans creating essentially an early form of insurance called bottomry. And, and I found this amazing book written in 1688 by a Sephardic Jew, and the book's called Confusion of Confusions, and it's sort of a diary of a trader in the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. And so we sit around, you know, you and I chatting on this podcast as if we're rediscovering the world and the investing world. Like these things have been around for a very long time, and often they're created independently, whether it's in China or ancient Greece. And so in a way, these simultaneous discoveries are that like the modern world needs the financial markets to function, whether it's insurance or stock markets. And a lot of the problems that we face today from a behavioral standpoint, like have been faced by people before us. And so that's one reason why I think education, sorry, history and learning is very important because it helps answer some of our problems today. But just seeing that in practice was extraordinary. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? I would hope and think that some of the moral values they would read to us every night at the dinner table and at breakfast in terms of they would have devotionals. They used to read St. Augustine's City of God to us, all that. But also, I think just the experience of learning and you know being homeschooled, I realized that you can teach yourself anything you know, if you set your mind to it. And most of my friends growing up died of AIDS because they were sharing needles. And I used to go to the eighth floor in Ramon y Cajal, which is the main hospital in Madrid, where the infectious diseases ward was. But at the entrance to the hospital, Ramon y Cajal was a neuroscientist who was the first Spaniard to win a Nobel. And there's a quote from him, and it says, Todo hombre puede ser el escultor de su propio cerebro si se lo propone, which is, every man can become the sculptor of his own mind if he sets himself the task. And that was the quote that inspired me as a kid every time I went into the hospital. And I think that that quote by Ramon y Cajal really has been an inspiration to me, one of the things that like, my parents have given to me and my brothers. That's great. All right, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? I think that you just have to be bold and creative and go out and do things. And I think that quite often, like, we self-censor or we don't think that we have the ability to go and do things. And it's interesting that going out and writing a book or starting a company or whatever it might be seems like a very bold move, but it can be tough doing it. But once you go out and do it, like, clients are interested in reading interesting stuff. If you can offer something that other people want to read or pay for, you can make a success of it. I worked at some jobs that I probably should have left earlier in my career. <laughs> but I also do have a theory in life that there's a spectrum. And some people psychologically have an extreme need for stability or what psychologists call belonging. Others have an extreme need for independence. And I think if you can figure out where you sit on that spectrum, it can then help inform your life choices. Not everyone should be an entrepreneur, if you, particularly if you're on the sort of need for stability and belonging side of the spectrum. I know that I'm on the high independent side of the spectrum. And so you have to live your life choices that are consistent with where you are on the spectrum. Great. Well, Jonathan, thanks so much for taking the time and good luck. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. 